This video is sponsored by bootcamp.com. Check it out for INBDE prep and use coupon code MENTALDENTAL for 10% off. Hey everyone, Dr. Ryan here and welcome back to our dental anatomy series. This video is going to be about the mandibular first molar. So here is a picture of the permanent mandibular first molar. And different from my other videos in this series, I'm showing you a photo with a restoration in the tooth. And that's by design to help you remember that this is the permanent tooth most likely to get caries. And that's thanks to it erupting at the young age of six years old, and also just having a lot of pits and fissures in it where caries can originate. And we'll talk about that later in the video. So using the universal tooth numbering system, this would include tooth number 19 and number 30. Now remember how the maxillary first molar was the widest tooth facio-lingually in the entire mouth? Well, the mandibular first molar is the widest tooth mesiodistally in the entire mouth. And spoiler alert, this isn't the only example we'll see of how the mandibular first molar is a complete opposite of the maxillary first molar. So we'll start like we always do with the facial aspect. The first thing I wanna point out are these two widespread roots. So you have two of them here, there's one mesial and one distal. And notice how the mesial root tends to curve more than the distal root does. The facial cusps are generally pretty blunt and you can see the lingual cusps because they're slightly longer or taller, although the mesiofacial cusp is the largest one by overall size. This is the only tooth in the mouth that has two grooves on its facial surface. So there's a facial groove right here and a distofacial groove right over there. There's also often a facial pit right at the end of that facial groove, which is the opposite of the maxillary first molar, where there's often a lingual pit at the end of its lingual groove. The reason why I point this out is because oftentimes, if there's a pretty noticeably sized pit, instead of just performing a sealant on the occlusal surface, which is most commonly done, you can sometimes, when it's appropriate, flow that sealant material into the facial pit for a mandibular first molar or the lingual pit of a maxillary first molar to do the best that you can proactively to prevent those areas from originating caries. Some dentists will call the facial height of contour a cervical ridge because it's fairly long, but it's not quite as pronounced as it is in the mandibular second molar, and we'll talk about that more in the next video. The lingual groove is very small, and it's almost never fissured, so you're not going to see a lingual pit on these teeth. It's also right in line with the bifurcation. The lingual height of contour is a bit higher than it was on the facial surface, and it's very prominent in order to hold the tongue back away from the teeth. So there's not much to say here for the mesial aspect of this tooth. The mesial surface of the root usually has a pretty deep root flute or depression that you can see in this picture. And the same is true for the distal side of this root. So that makes the mesial root overall biconcave. And it typically houses two separate root canals that are separated by this root fluting. We'll get to see a better picture of that later in the video. Once again, for the distal aspect, we're going to see a shorter marginal ridge, which enables us to see more of the occlusal surface or occlusal table from this view. There's also a flatter cervical line, and the distal root is a little bit narrower than the mesial root, which you can kind of see poking out behind there. From this angle, you can also appreciate the difference in cusp heights that we briefly mentioned from the facial aspect. So the blunt facial cusps versus the tall lingual cusps. And you might remember we saw the opposite trend 
in the maxillary molars, where the lingual cusps were more blunted, while the facial cusps were taller. So why is that a pattern that we're seeing? Well, in the maxillary molars, the lingual cusps were the holding cusps, and in the mandibular molars, the facial cusps take that role. And we went over this when we talked about the maxillary molars, but you can see that very well illustrated in this picture where those holding cusps are the ones in contact most directly with the opposing teeth, hence why they're by design more blunted. And that leaves the non-holding cusps taller in order to push away or keep away the soft tissues from impeding on the functioning teeth. For this tooth, the facial root trunk, again, area between cervical line and furcation, is shorter than the lingual root trunk. Or in other words, the facial CEJ is closer to the bifurcation than the lingual CEJ is. So I hope you didn't forget about our mini molar tooth, that's the mandibular second premolar, because there's some indirect resemblance to that tooth. That tooth, if you recall, was a pentagon shape, where I told you it looked like a house. The occlusal table was like the walls of the house, and the facial surface was like the roof of that house. Now, this tooth is also a pentagon shape, but this time the roof corresponds to the fifth cusp, the distal cusp, sticking out to the side. And the other four cusps create the four corners of the house. Now, since these two teeth, the mandibular first molar and the mandibular second premolar, are right next to each other in the mouth, my hope is that you can remember the two houses are neighbors with each other, and unfortunately, one of the houses got knocked down. Another cool thing is the maxillary first molar had three lingual cusps, including the cusp of Caribelli, whereas the mandibular first molar has three facial cusps, just the opposite. So by that token, it makes sense that this tooth would converge toward the lingual, just the opposite that we saw in the maxillary first molar. So the facial half is larger than the lingual half. However, there's a similarity between this tooth and the maxillary first molar in that the mesial half is wider than the distal half. And so the tooth, in other words, converges towards the distal. This is the biggest occlusal table in the entire mouth, and so most chewing occurs on this tooth. You might also remember the Y-type mandibular second premolar. That was the most common anatomical variety for that tooth. And here now we have what I'm calling the Y5 tooth. And that's because there are five cusps, mesiofacial, distofacial, distal, distolingual, and mesiolingual. And the major grooves of the tooth form a Y, hence Y5. And so those grooves are the facial groove, which separates the mesiofacial and distofacial cusps, the distofacial groove, which separates the distofacial and the distal cusps, and it's also the groove through which the oblique ridge of the opposing maxillary first molar sits. The lingual groove separates the mesiolingual and distolingual cusps, and then the central groove travels from distal pit to mesial pit. The central pit right in here is the deepest part of the occlusal surface. As far as the pulp is concerned, there are five pulp horns, that's one for each of the cusp tips. 65% of the time, there are three canals, that's two canals in the mesial root and one in the distal root. 32% of the time, they have four canals, that would be two canals in the mesial root and two canals in the distal root. And only about 3% of the time, much less likely, there's only two canals, which would be one canal in the mesial root and one canal in the distal root, which is not shown here in the diagram.
In this series, when I get to this slide, traditionally, the dark gray area is showing you the widest portion of the crown, basically the outline of the crown, whereas the white inner part is showing a cross-section slice right at the CEJ, which this image shows really well. So that would correspond to that white area there. And then the gray inner parts correspond to the pulp, what the pulp would look like at this slice. So that makes the cross section of the CEJ kind of like a square or a rectangle shape. But I don't care so much about that, to be honest. What I want you more to focus on is what we've talked about before with the mid root cross sections, which are shown here. So the distal root is oval shaped while the mesial root is biconcave, since it has two concavities, or we can call it ribbon shaped. And if you go back to either of the mandibular incisor videos, that's almost exactly what they looked like in cross section at the middle of their roots. Also, as an aside, these are the longest roots of all of the molars. Not all of the teeth, though. The canine roots still hold the title for the longest roots in the entire mouth, specifically the maxillary canine. For a summary of the mandibular first molar, the mesiodistal dimension is greater than the facial lingual dimension, which is greater than the occluso cervical dimension. Y5 is what I want you to remember, Y for the shape of the grooves, 5 for the amount of cusps that there are. In order from biggest to smallest, we have mesiofacial, then mesiolingual, distolingual, then distofacial, and finally the small fifth distal cusp, 4 grooves, and 3 pits. So the pattern is 5, 4, 3, which is the exact same pattern we saw in the maxillary first molar. Nice and easy to help us remember that. It looks like a trapezoid from the facial view, like all the molars do. It's a rhombus from the side view that's leaning toward the lingual. That's the same pattern that we've seen for all mandibular posterior teeth. It looks like a pentagon from the occlusal view, that's the crown of course, whereas the cross section at the CEJ looks like a rectangle, but I want you to remember that mesial root is biconcave or ribbon shaped. And then it consists of primarily five developmental lobes, five pulp horns, and three pulp canals. That's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and subscribe to this channel for much more on dentistry. If you'd like to support me, please check out my Patreon page. And thank you to all of my patrons for their support. You can unlock access to my video slides to take notes on and practice questions for the board exams. So go check that out. The link is in the description. Thanks again for watching everyone. I'll see you in the next video.